I was reading one time about someone who was visiting Japan. And it happened to be during the summer, and this one day it was really hot and humid. Emerson commented to the mother of the family where he or she was staying, I've forgotten whether it was a woman or a man, but said to the mother, Boy, it's really hot. And the mother said, Yes, the cicadas really are loud, aren't they? So tonight the cicadas are loud. It's been a warm day, but we have to learn how to be content. We have a place to practice where it's quiet, we can find seclusion. And even though the temperature may not be the temperature we like, a lot of the other factors are perfectly fine. This is one of the ways in which you put up with difficult situations, is focus on the parts that are not difficult. Look at the opportunities, look at the advantages that you still have, even in a very hot day, in a very hot place. These are things where we should learn to be content. And if you think in the right way, the heat doesn't have to weigh down on you. Remember that story about a John Fuang, suddenly caught in a rainstorm one night, and all he had was his little umbrella tent. And this meditation was, the body may be wet, but the mind isn't wet. He contemplated that, repeated it to himself, and contemplated it at the same time. And the mind really did take note of the fact that wetness was not a property of the mind, it was a property of the body. And when you take possession of the body, there you are, you're open to the suffering of being wet and cold. Here you're open to the suffering of being hot if you take possession of the body. That's what you're focusing on. Do you have the choice to focus or not? And one of the ways to content yourself is to focus on the things that are easy right now, things that are convenient. So you can focus on the issue where you should not be content, is the fact there's still unskillful qualities in the mind. This is an area where we really do have to put forth effort. When the Buddha was teaching to go to me about the basic principles of how you can tell what's dharma and vinaya and what's not, the three of the principles that have to do with your practice, how you deal with yourself, contentment, aroused persistence, and what he calls shedding. The shedding here seems to mean or apply primarily to the shedding of pride. Because pride gets in the way of our learning anything from anybody. There's stories in the Terigata and the Terigata. A young man who was really proud of his good looks. There wasn't anybody he was going to bow down to. He finally one day was able to bow down to the Buddha, and then he realized how foolish he was, that the looks of the body are nothing. Because what is this body? It's nothing but material elements with all these orifices that have things flowing out all the time. And it's just waiting to die. If you're not proud about your body, you might be proud about your attainments, proud about how intelligent you are, how good a meditator you are. I mean, there's a certain amount of self-confidence that's needed in the practice, but when pride gets in the way, that's the end. You stop right there. So it's interesting that when the Buddha is talking about the factors of the practice, 
in those eight principles. He really focuses on contentment, shedding pride, and then arousing your persistence. Are there any areas where things outside that you're not content with? Learn how to develop content. Any areas where you're holding on to pride that's getting in the way of your learning? You have to be happy to let it go. Realize that it's a burden, something to drop. There are three other principles that he talks about that have to do more with your relationship with other people. On the one hand, you're modest. Again, you don't go showing off what you've got. There's that story about the novice who was able to levitate every day. He took Anuruddha's bowl. Anuruddha was his teacher. He took Anuruddha's bowl to the, the big lake up in the Himalayas. I've forgotten the name. But he didn't want anybody to know. So he was quiet about his attainments. As for the other qualities that have to do with your getting along with other people, there's seclusion. You're really looking for a time to be quiet, as the Buddha says. When people come to visit you, you speak to them to the extent that they will be happy to go away. Not that you're driving them away, but you take care of what they need and that's it. You don't sort of stitch a few extra connections to make them stay. Because the question is, when you try to pull on their strings, they're going to try to pull on your strings, and they don't have any time to practice. You take care of people's needs. As meditators, our main way of taking care of their needs is to talk to their issues about the Dharma. So you're going to have time to go back to your practice. The other quality having to do with your dealings with other people is being unburdensome, doing whatever you can not to place a burden on other people. Again, this is very directly tied to being content. But it also means looking after yourself. We know that we here depend on our supporters for our health care. So you do what you can to keep yourself healthy. Again, without placing a burden on others. It's a very delicate balancing act. But it's important that you keep this in mind. Because the way you practice does have an impact on others. You want it to be a gift to them. The Buddha said one of our motivations for practicing is that if we reach one of the noble attainments, then the gifts that people have given to us will bear them great fruit. This is our way of paying them back. So there's no clear line between your inner practice and your dealings with other people. Shedding is con connected to modesty. Contentment is connected to being unburdensome. And your aroused persistence is connected to your seclusion. And all this is for the two factors that have to do with the results, being unfettered and dispassion. The two of them go together because passion is our primary fetter. The big issue, of course, is passion for sensuality. That's the one we have to focus on first. All too often you hear people focusing first on getting stuck on jhana, getting stuck on concentration. Well, you want to get stuck on that first so you can let go of your other attachments. As the Buddha once said, if you don't have the pleasure that comes from, from jhana or something better, you're not going to be able to let go of your attachment to sensuality. No matter how much you understand about it, no matter how much you've read about it and worked on your discernment to see the drawbacks of sensuality, you're going to need something to take its place. So for the time being, allow yourself to get passionate about the concentration. As John Fuang once said, you're never going to meditate really well unless you're crazy about the meditation. So 
So even in situations where you don't have much time in the course of the day, you, part of your mind should be looking for the little cracks where you can meditate, where you can be with the breath. I really study the issues of the breath, learn to understand what this bodily fabrication is. It has an impact on feelings, and of course feelings have an impact on the mind. Now as you think about the breath and evaluate the breath, you learn about perceptions. All these fabrications, bodily, verbal, and mental, they're very intimately connected. And when you're doing concentration, they're all right here. You can see ways of dealing with the breath that have to do with putting physical pressure on it, or changing your posture, relaxing different muscles, the different patterns of tension in the body. And how do you relax them? Well, you pay attention to them. And John Lee talks about your breath and your mindfulness. And here by mindfulness he means both mindfulness and alertness are like a medicine. As you survey around the body, you'll find some spots that are tight. Obstructed. It's too solid. And just focus on them very gently. And you'll develop it a sense of just how much pressure of your focus is appropriate and how much is too much. It's in this way that being crazy about the meditation is a good way of developing discernment. You go around the body, you learn a lot of things about how you hold the body, how you breathe, how the breath has an impact on your perceptions, how your perceptions have an impact on the breath. Because that's another way of dealing with that breath, of adjusting it, just changing your perception of it. The body is a sponge, is one perception. And John Fuing used to talk about this column of breath energy in the middle of the body, from the head on down. And think when the breath comes in that it's coming through all your pores, coming in to nourish that column and then going out. There's also the perception of what John Lee calls the the tough breath, Thai, it's om neo. It's a hard concept to translate in English, because neo means both tough and sticky. But it's basically the breath seen really as solid. It's the kind of breath that allows you to sit here without needing to breathe. Did you think of that sense of the solid, strong breath? It's not so much a moving breath, it's a solid, still breath, allowing to fill the body. Just hold that perception in mind, and you see that it has an impact on how you breathe. So there's a lot to explore here when you get crazy about your meditation. You begin to realize that this area of the body here, the body as you feel it from within, has lots of issues going on and lots of interesting things, and they're very intimately related to interesting things happening in the mind. So this is one of the ways in which you can loosen your passion for sensual pleasures, because you've found the passion for concentration, the things you can learn, the benefits you gain. from focusing on the breath whenever you have the chance. It's only after you've explored these things really thoroughly that you can ultimately develop a dispassion for them as well. But in the meantime, work primarily on those fetters of sensuality or passion for sensuality through the various means that the Buddha recommended. Being content, that's the big one. When you find that you're not content with your situation, ask yourself, okay, what are you thirsting for? What are you hungering for? The 
And once you get it, how long can you keep it? Is it worth it? Wouldn't it be better to develop the skills of mind where you don't need those things? If you're going to be discontent about something, focus on the fact that you still haven't put enough effort into the practice. There are certain things in the mind you haven't shed yet. As for dealing with others, work on the work that needs to be done here at the monastery, and the rest of the time is time for seclusion. Do what you can not to be a burden. Be helpful but modest. It's when you live in this way that you are practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma, for the sake of the Dharma. And that's when our life together here at the monastery yields benefits, and how your own practice yields benefits. There's a continuum here. It's not one or the other. And it's in seeing how all these things come together that you really understand them and get the most out of them. <laughs>